Hi. Coming from DC, I'll have to start with a DC story that goes back to um, the Lyndon Johnson years. And there was a woman who came with the Johnsons from Kansas whose name was Liz Carpenter. She was a speechwriter. She was herself a very good speaker, great sense of humor. And she was in, uh, after the White House years, she wrote a book. And she was on a book tour one night in Atlanta, Georgia. And she chance to meet her former White House colleague, Arthur Schlesinger. As she was walking through the lobby, Arthur was sitting there. He said, hey, Liz, that was a great book of yours. I enjoyed it. Who wrote it for you? <laughs> she said, Arthur, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Who read it to you? <laughs> We've We've been hearing a lot tonight about change and how fast things are going to change. And, and I, I should also say, um, as someone parachuted in from the outside, I, 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 I sense the energy here among you all in working on these issues and a sense of excitement that I think is, is very healthy. Um, during the next decade, I think we're going to see half a century of change. It's, it's coming and it's accelerating, it's moving very fast. Um, the energy transition, of course, is, is the heart of the, of, the, of the change, going from fossil fuels. I mean, originally it was wood, and then with the Industrial Revolution, we started that with coal, and then it was coal and oil. And now we're switching from the fossil fuels to, to renewable sources of, of energy. Um, we have... Uh, some extraordinarily exciting possibilities now of having a, a no-carbon energy system. Um, and one of the great things about renewable energy is that how much you use today has no influence on how much is available tomorrow. You can't say that with fossil fuels, but with wind and solar, how much you use today does not detract in any way from how much is available tomorrow. And we're beginning to see uh, a number of uh, exciting developments. I'm just going to pick off several of them, all involving different countries. Um, the first one's actually a state, California. Um, a few weeks ago, one day when they had very good wind and bright sun and everything was working, California got 57% of its electricity from, from renewables. 57%. California, we call it a state, it's almost another country, 40 million people. Um, so California is really uh, uh, moving on the, on the energy front. In Denmark, electri electricity from wind in some days, on good wind days, can supply virtually all of Denmark's electricity. I remember flying in from... Uh, um, from Helsinki into Copenhagen a couple of years ago. Um, and as, you, as we were approaching Copenhagen and Denmark more broadly, there were wind turbines, hundreds of them, in, in the water, on the, on the shore. It was just a, an exciting thing to see so many wind turbines there. And um, it, it now, uh, those turbines are producing enough electricity that some days Denmark can get by with wind only. Then we have in the UK. The UK was kind of a, a late starter on the renewable energy thing, but they're moving fast now. Um, in 2016, wind overtook coal as a source of electricity in the UK. Now, remember that the Industrial Revolution began in the UK and coal was the was the fuel for that. And now suddenly, that's literally becoming history as, as wind um, begins to play a much more prominent role. In Spain, wind has eclipsed nuclear power. Nuclear power is growing like this. Wind was growing like this. China. Wind has overtaken nuclear power in China. And again, it's the curves. Nuclear power was growing like this. Wind was growing like this. So wind 
is, is really moving now in some important countries in the world. Um, Denmark, uh, just to show how fast things are moving there, in 2013, Denmark was getting 34% of its electricity from wind. 2013 and 2014, it, it moved up to 43%. 2015, it was more than half. 2017, this year, it's going to be pretty close to, um, to all of the uh, electricity in, in Denmark. So we're seeing some really rapid movement. And then in the United States, we have some states that are moving fast. Uh, Iowa, South Dakota, I think both of them on, on good wind days have gotten half of their electricity from wind. And then Texas. Texas is interesting because it, it was the oil state in the old economy, and I think it's going to be the wind state in the new economy. Not just because of what they're doing in Texas, but there are huge investments in wind farms now underway in, in Texas. But they're planning to export wind-generated electricity into the southeast, southeastern states, Louisiana, Mississippi, states where wind is not nearly as strong, and also um, moving it west. Um, into uh, New Mexico and, uh, and Arizona. The, Kansas is also beginning to move out with, uh, with wind energy. And it is building a, one transmission line, um, if you can sort of visualize Can Kansas in the central mid one transmission line is going toward the Chicago, what I call the Chicago complex, densely populated, a lot of industry and so forth. The other one is going toward the southeast, which has been slow to develop its um, wind electricity, part because it, the wind is not nearly as strong in the southeast as it is in the, in, in the high plains, for example, where Kansas is. So we're, we're beginning to see um, these things um, unfold in an exciting way. And we've, we've always had this uh, NIMBY problem, not in my backyard. But for farmers and ranchers, if someone proposes installing wind turbines on their land, I mean, they suddenly become PIMBYs, put it in my backyard, because they know if they have wind turbines on their land, they may earn more from the, the royalties they get. They don't have to invest anything. The, 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 the energy companies take care of that. But they, they may earn more from the royalties they get from the electricity generated on their land than they do from the cattle they sell. And they don't have to do anything. Uh, just sit and watch. And suddenly, they have a major new source of, of, uh, of income. We're seeing electric cars beginning to catch on now. Some countries much faster than others. China's making a big push. In Norway, 27% of the new cars sold last year were electric cars. Now, Norway's been thinking in this direction for some time because they have a huge amount of hydropower. They actually export hydroelectricity to uh, Sweden, to, to Denmark, to Germany. Um, but they're planning to use that electricity for um, um, running cars. We're also seeing a lot of progress in closing coal-fired power plants. It's, it's just amazing. I, I, I mean, the president said he's going to rally you know, the, the coal industry. <laughs> It's not going to happen. Coal is basically finished. It's only a matter of time until the remaining coal plants are closed. Coal is actually more costly than either wind or solar. And then you have all the pollution problems, of course, and, and people don't want coal-fired power plants in their backyards. So we're going to see uh, some interesting developments here. Um, the Sierra Club, which has been leading environmental and, and health and other groups in closing coal-fired power plants, um, be, began this in 2010. And their first goal was to challenge in court all the coal-fired power plants that were to be built. And they managed to stop every one of them. They were like, I don't know, 136 or something. Um, so that was a major... Um, uh, 
But now they're in stage two, which is closing the existing ones. I think in 2010, there were 530 coal-fired power plants in the United States. I think to date, I say to date, my date is probably a year or two old now, they've closed 190 out of the 530, leaving 340 to go. But it's just a matter of time. Coal, coal is history. Um, by 2030, the goal of the Sierra Club is that there will be no coal plants operating in the United States. But I think they're going to get there. They're going to close mo most of them well before 2030. Then we have another interesting development uh, on campuses around the country. And this, this started, I think, in Stanford, but it's spread to many, uh, many campuses now. It's called the, uh, it's the Divestment Initiative, where Stanford had um, in its portfolio, its investment portfolio, a lot of money in, in oil and, 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 and gas and, and even some coal. And the students just rose up and said, you know, this is not, this is not what we want. And we have an obligation uh, as an educational institution to begin changing this. So a number of campuses now, I mean, many of them, have uh, moved ahead and begun to um, uh, actively uh, uh, work on, on closing coal plants. And certainly, any that are left on campus have, have, have now been, been, uh, been closed. Another university that's moving strong in this area now is Syracuse. The Guardian newspaper has now, um, the Guardian in the UK, has now come out and, and very strongly um, presses for getting rid of coal plants everywhere. And it's interesting to see a newspaper, they're supposed to be sort of neutral on these things unless it's on the editorial page, but the, they've said this is not something to be neutral about anymore, it's too important. We've, we've got to close coal plants everywhere. Now, in looking ahead, and looking at the sorts of skills that are needed and the ones that are becoming obsolete, and this is something that students everywhere are, are beginning to uh, wrestle with. Um, when I was graduating way back in the, in the 50s, um, we had coal mining was a major employee, and, and those who were working on advanced degrees would be doing things like petroleum geology and these sorts of things. But that's all history now. The skills needed now are solar engineers, wind engineers, wind meteorologists. Meteorology, you know, the guys who do the meteorologists, the guys who do the weather reports, now wind is becoming, um, is acquiring an importance that goes far beyond its consequences in the, in the old uh, uh, weather reports. So, in terms of new skills, we need wind engineers, wind meteorologists, solar engineers, just a whole list of, um, of things that didn't exist um, um, a decade or two ago. Now, another interesting and sort of revealing thing about um, renewable energy is, for me, is to watch the smart money and see where it's going today. And by smart money, I mean people like Warren Buffett, Phil Anschutz, Ted Turner. Warren Buffett, I think it was three years ago, allocated $15 billion for in, in basically investment in renewable sources of energy, wind and solar. And then a year ago, he added another $15 billion. I mean, that's, this is just one person. That's a very substantial investment in, in, this, in this sector. A second person who's investing heavily now is a guy named Phil Anschutz, A-N-S-C-H-U-T-Z. He's from Denver, and he made his 
first billions on coal and oil, much of it in Wyoming. But he's backed away now, and he's investing in wind farms. And Wyoming, as you know, has a lot of wind and not many people. So he's, he, he wants to export uh, wind-generated electricity from Wyoming, and he is building a 3,000 megawatt wind farm in Wyoming. That's three nuclear power complexes. 3,000 megawatts of wind and a 700-mile transmission line that will take it to California, which has 40 million people. Um, so this is um, one, one person and, and, and what he's able to do. Um, Ted Turner's another. Ted, as most of you know, was the, the founder of CNN. And, and, and he pioneered two concepts. One, having round-the-clock television news, you know, updating it as, as, as the day goes. We didn't used to have that. I mean, if you're young, you prob probably have taken this for granted. But it's a relatively recent thing. And the other thing Ted wanted to do was to broadcast globally. He wanted everyone to have access to this information. So he really revolutionized the, the communications um, uh, uh, business. Um, he, he also has invested in seven solar power plants in the southern part of the United States. He has teamed up with Southern Power, which is the large uh, utility in that region. One of the other things we're beginning to see now is what I call stranded assets as we make the transition from fossil fuels to solar and wind energy. We see them coal mines. Coal mines that once were worth a lot of money are now worthless. Um, Coal-fired power plants, they're being closed all the time. They have no alternative value. And then we have, um, we have coal companies going bankrupt. I mean, right down the line. Um, one of them, the big one, of course, is Peabody. And it declared bankruptcy uh, just over a year ago. Uh, Alpha is another. But the, the coal companies are, are, are biting the dust because their markets are shrinking. And um, they've got... Uh, uh, huge investments in, uh, in, in coal fields as, as well as in, in plants. One of the interesting things, I may have mentioned this earlier, earlier, about wind and solar energy is that how much we consume today does not have any effect on the amount that we have tomorrow. That was not true for fossil fuels. The more coal you use, the more oil you pump, the less you had in the future. So one of the great things about renewables is that they just keep coming. I think I've, I've covered most of the points I wanted to, and I, I wanted to be sure and save adequate time for Q&A. Um, someone here is going to... Uh, moderate and take care of the Q&A part. Uh, How about a round of applause? I think. Yeah. Hey. Thanks. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us, Lester. Does anybody have any questions from the crowd? Anyone? Can we turn up the house lights just a little, please? Thank you. Um, what is being done to ensure migratory bird issues and other animal issues that the wind turbines were having problems with originally? Right. Um, that, that emerged as, a, as an issue with, uh, with wind, of course, uh, early on. Um, a number of things are happening. One, they're beginning to design wind turbines so that um, they, 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 
Um, they make a noise that warns birds um, so they don't just fly into them. Um, the, I'm trying to think of the, there are two or three other things that, that are, are being done that have greatly reduced this as a, as a problem. Um, and I think, it's, I, I think it's probably going to uh, uh, end up not being um, uh, a serious problem at all. Thanks. Lester, can I help answer that? Um, yeah. There is a company called For Navitas that is uh, the father company is Siemens, and we just recently gave them an award, but they invented the technology. Um, I'm gonna, I, I don't want to ruin what they do, so, because this is not my forte. But if you guys look, at, they, they've invented vertical axis wind turbines, which nullifies the birds dying at an exponential rate. Right, they turn if that helps. Yes. Sort of like an egg beater going around like this, if I remember the, 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 the design of them. Um, can you talk a little bit about the role of current companies and the distribution system? Is there a role in the future for uh, individual homeowners, individual small businesses being able to have access to to this renewable energy without depending upon the current company structures that dictate and have a lot of influence in terms of policy, what do you see as the future of moving away from the current structure in terms of the dominant companies today towards a different type of a future which is a little bit more free form and independent? Yeah, there, there are two ways to go on this. Um, I mean, in, the companies have grids, and if they are uh, accessible to people with rooftop solar or maybe more than rooftop solar, um, then um, the, the, the utility can help even things out. If someone is producing uh, more than they need, they can, they can sell it. So this is becoming... Um, fairly common now in, in utilities in this country that they will buy excessive solar or wind power. Um, and in the process, um, they, can, they, can, they can stabilize um, power sources because they, they have such a large area they're working on. I mean, I've, I've heard some uh, engineers talk about this at the, at the national level. Um, the, the larger the area is that's being used for wind energy, for example, um, the more stable the, the energy coming from the, the turbines is. Uh, so size, um, uh, if you, you have a small wind farm and it's, it's very local, then, then you get pretty wide fluctuations. But as you broaden it and, and cover large areas um, with, with, with grids, then you can um, you, can, you, can, um, you, you can take care of the local fluctuations by putting them all together, and they tend to even, even out. I mean, someone uh, who's worked on this pointed out if we had a national grid uh, for renewables in this country, that um, it could... Um, it would take care of many of the fluctuations because while the wind may be blowing in one place or the sun's shining brightly on another, then, then these things change. But if you have them all on the same grid, then they, they tend to offset each other. Any other questions? Hey, thanks for coming uh, right here. Okay. Hey, uh, you've been at this for a long time. There's obviously been a lot of changes in the last 10, 20 years. Uh, I guess my question to you is, what keeps you going? Are you an optimist or are you a glutton for pain? <laughs> what was the second one? A glutton for pain. <laughs> I've been asked the question, are you an optimist or a pessimist? Probably uh, more times than I care to, uh, to, to remember. Um, I am excited by what is happening now and the way 
um, in which economics alone, market forces, are driving a shift from coal to solar and wind. It's now becoming cheaper. Um, renewables are, are, are now much below coal or fossil fuels generally in terms of cost. So that's a, that's a major uh, uh, advantage that we now, now have. I think the other thing is that people, you know, there was a time not too long ago when you talk about wind or solar, you know, it was, it was nice, but, you know, we knew it was only going to be this much. But now we can begin to see where it's the whole show. And, and that's what's so, so exciting. And the, uh, the economics are so attractive. I mean, one of the things I've looked at is, is nuclear power. Um, nuclear simply cannot compete with wind and solar in terms of price. Probably, if I were to use round numbers, probably nuclear versus solar and wind is about two to one. I mean, there's a huge difference. It's not a marginal difference. Um, Okay, next. <laughs> I have a loud voice, so I'll ask. Okay. I'll be quieter. Um, how many of the big companies like Exxon, VP, are quietly transitioning to renewable technologies? I haven't looked at at this particular issue for, for some time, but um, I think it's becoming clear to the, the old energy types, the, uh, the fossil fuel uh, energy companies, that the die is pretty well cast. And they can resist it, they can try, but it's, things are moving. And, and the market is moving things now um, with, with uh, um, solar and wind generated electricity coming in way under coal or oil. Um, so that's, uh, I think, the most, if I were to pick the most encouraging single thing that I can think of right now, it would be um, that market forces are now beginning to drive the energy transition and, and drive in a major way. Hello. Hi. Oh, that's loud. Um, I'm back over here. Um, we, we, uh, if you look far into the future, uh, you know, solar panels are being installed on roofs of houses and buildings. Uh, a local group called Leap is, has uh, 500 people, I believe, signed up for a Solarize Virginia in one week. So that's a huge number of people installing solar. How do you see the transition going from the uh, centralized generation of power uh, transition to the uh, more democratized version? where maybe, you know, we need load balancing and energy storage to sort of balance out the supply and demand. I think we are going to have to work on energy storage, um, partly to deal with some of the you know, the sun doesn't shine at night, for example, and if you need energy during the night, then storage becomes a factor. I think one of the growth industries um, uh, in, in the years ahead is, is, going, to be, is going to be batteries. Um, and uh, you, you see people like Elon Musk now moving into this, this area. Um, he's, he's, he's one who's usually out in front and usually right on, on most of these things. Um, So I think, I think the market is going to do much more than we, than we expect or realize, simply because until fairly recently, the market did not give renewables you know, much of an advantage. But now they give them a, a very substantial advantage because the cost of, um, of, of solar cells has come way down. And we haven't talked much about China tonight, but China is revolutionizing uh, its, its energy sector. And it, it, it has totally dominates uh, production of solar cells in the world uh, today. And they're both exporting them and, and using them at, at home. Um, China's also got an enormous amount of wind power uh, coming online. And I, I had a graph um, uh, that looked like this. And this was sort of uh, nuclear power in China, 
growing steadily, predictably, and wind was just going like this. I mean, it, it literally blew by uh, nuclear uh, very quickly. So um, we're going to see, um, I don't think any utility in this country today would think seriously about building a nuclear power plant. There are still some that had them under construction, and even some of them are, are giving up because the costs are becoming greater. One of the reasons the costs are becoming greater is that the, the people who produce all the parts, the companies, can now see that there's not that much of a future there. So some of them are, are shifting their, their, their production lines. Some of them are just backing out of nuclear-related things altogether. And that makes it more difficult for those who are building nuclear power plants to, to, to do it economically. So I think, I mean, I think nuclear is, at least in the market e economies, maybe not necessarily in Russia or even in, in China, but in most of the world, I, I think it's pretty well, uh, it's going to become history. Great. We've got time for just one more question. Hi. Hi. Um, so I have a question about the role of education and how do you, uh, what is your vision of educating um, people who would otherwise don't care about renewables? Uh, they're in the complete opposite spectrum. You know, the, um, the science of fossil fuels and climate change is really junior high school science. I mean, you know, the more CO2 there is in the atmosphere, um, that doesn't affect the incoming sunlight, but it does affect the outgoing radiation. It doesn't radiate. Um, light goes through um, uh, this... Uh, the growing uh, quantities of CO2, but, but the radiation doesn't, so we're, we're warming the Earth. And there's not anything very complex about that. I mean, it, it, it is junior high school science, uh, but it's, it's, it's happening. Um, the, I, I think one of the, in, in thinking of education, um, we probably ought to have a few more journals magazines focusing on, on, on these, new, um, these new energy sources. The, the, the development of solar and wind has kind of out, um, outstripped the, uh, the information structure that's needed to, uh, to support and to foster uh, them. Um, I think we also have to think about educating teachers and, and think about the sort of courses that are being offered. I remember some years ago now, I was up in, I think, North Dakota and was talking about the need at the university to begin offering um, uh, a major in um, uh, wind meteorology and, 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 and electricity generation. Um, these are, um, I, mean, I mean, the science is not new here, but not everyone understands it. So using um, uh, these things, and, and, and particularly in talking about skills, I mentioned the kind of skills we don't really need much of anymore, like um, petroleum geology, for example. We're not doing very much in that field anymore, but we do need wind meteorologists and wind engineers and, um, and solar engineers. We need um, also more experience in designing and uh, integrating uh, the new energy sources in, into homes, for example. Um, it's also interesting that there are now some major builders around the world, the ones who do thousands of new homes every year, who, who now automatically incorporate solar panels in their, in their rooftops. And, and it is a very good selling point when, when people are buying a house and the idea that they won't be spending very much on electricity, um, 
is sort of appealing. I mean, that's a long-term uh, appeal. So it's partly uh, understanding the economics and realizing that the market is beginning to drive these things. It's not someone in Washington who's trying to um, uh, force people to, uh, to, to do these things. They, the, the market is really, uh, really playing a role now, and it's going to play even more of a role in the, in the future. Thank you so much. Have a round of applause for Lester Brown.